Okay, okay, welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Warriors Whiteboard Wednesday. Dashian Miller here from Warrior Concepts. It's right up there in the upper corner. See it? Anyway, all right, so uh, this week, right, uh, this is May 24th of 2023 for anybody that cares and is keeping track. Uh, what we're going to do is take another round around this idea of muto dori, right? We're going to take a look at this idea, um, what it is, and um, how to actually gain an advantage in a situation where um, – He's armed and you're not. Okay. So again, what we're going to be covering, I'm going to define it briefly. And we're going to take a look at uh, a couple of a couple of uh, reasons you could end up in a situation like that. Right. We have to make sure that we're not just generally speaking, like a lot of uh, people when they jump into fight science or martial arts or whatever, where there's this singular idea or they have a very limited viewpoint on things. We have to remember, right. Life is messy and bad guys are tricky shits, okay? And we need to make sure that we're as prepared as possible for as many types of attackers, as many types of attacks, as many different environments and situations and those kind of things if we're really focused on survival. Because whatever our definition is, whatever your definition is for what you're doing, that's the ceiling. That's as far as you're going, okay? So we need to be careful, okay? Because if something comes from in, inside, from out, uh, of that kind of thing, we're screwed, all right? So we're gonna take a look at situation or uh, three different uh, situations where we would be put into uh, this kind of idea or this kind of a situation. And we're also gonna take a look at four points in time for uh, for dealing with it, okay? All right, so before I do that, I, I need to address something uh, that pops up quite often in the comment sections on the videos, right? I couldn't care less about people who call me Santa for whatever reason, right? Fat and a great beard, whatever, right? Or fat or whatever, right? Like what? Bad guys don't target anybody but 20-somethings with six-pack abs, okay? It's not about that, right? Often people want to get into a pissing contest about whether or not uh, a given technique or something like that that I show works, okay? And if I go to point something out, they'll say something like, everybody knows you fight like, right? Uh, or when you're fighting, right? I, this comes up with knife things or stick things, right? When you're fighting with this thing, you only think about, okay? This is something the ego does. It depersonalizes things that isn't a success for it, right? This is one of those things that we do as a self-check, okay? For rewards, ego says, I, see what I did, right? I would, right? I'm the badass, whatever, okay? But when we're in uncomfortable waters or we're talking about a mistake or trauma or whatever that happened to us, we'll say, man, when you're in a situation like that, you, you, you right, we'll use the word you, okay? So my response to people that say, when you're in a fight, you only think about, my response is, no, when you're in a fight, you only think about. Again, there's that definition and that ceiling, right? I wouldn't be covering this stuff if in an attack situation, I thought the same way that you do. I wouldn't have all this stuff that I'm covering. Okay. I don't do research before my, my, uh, my episodes to see, let's see, what can I teach? Uh, what's important to cover and all that. This is from 40 plus years of dealing with violent people. Right. So you can make fun of the shape. You can make fun of the age. You can make fun of the ripped pants, whatever. Right. Uh, make fun of whatever you want. It doesn't change the fact that one of us can do this and, well, most of you have one or zero subscribers and no videos to be able to back up what you think you're spewing, okay? Not you, the guys that are on this to actually learn. We're not talking about you. I'm, I'm using the word you in a general sense, okay? So anyway, I needed to get that out of the way uh, because sometimes these children need to be spanked, all right? Anyway, all right, so let's do this. Let's take a look at uh, Muto Dori, right? So this is kanji, right? <coughs> Excuse me. I'm probably going to get the stroke order uh, out of order, right? <coughs> right? Mu, to, right? The blade, right? And then dori, I always screw this one up, so I'm going to borrow my cheat sheet here. <coughs> do, 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 do. Okay, muto dori. Okay, muto dori. The word mu means without or lacking. 
Okay. To is a blade, right? To, T O, to. Okay. Um, if you change that, right, that's what most people are used to seeing in the kanji nin. Okay. Often mistranslated, but it can also be generally translated, right? Okay. So this, okay, this little hash mark that I had on there is really, really important. This is a blade in general. This, okay, you can still say to, but it's kisaki. Okay. This slash makes this the working dangerous edge of the blade, the working part. Okay. We're going to be talking about working parts of weapons here quite a bit during this one. And dori means to catch, capture, seize, that kind of thing. Okay. So again, conventional translation without a blade catch, right? So it, it's, it's implying that I'm unarmed against a blade, except that it doesn't stop there, okay? Especially in the ninja's arts. In the ninja's arts, to is just a, it's a placekeeper for any weapon, okay? He's armed, I'm not. Well, we're always armed, right? And if you can get your head wrapped around the idea that even if you're unarmed, okay, and he is armed, right? He brought my weapon to the fight, and I appreciate it, okay? So, um, again, but that's a mindset thing, Okay. So there are lots of techniques, there are lots of ideas, uh, whatever, right, that we could, we could approach this from, okay? Um, but I think what's really, really important, <coughs> excuse me, um, what's really important is that we look at uh, how we could end up here, right? We need to do that first, okay? So uh, actually, before I even jump into that, right, um, we need to remember, one, as always, what I'm covering here, these are potentials. These are possibilities, okay? Um, they're not givens, just like a kata. When people argue over kata or they argue over techniques, my favorite technique or whatever, okay? They're potentials. They're possibilities, but what there's way too many variables, right? We need to train so that we can we can catch the moment. Kudai dori, catching the right space, catching the right opportunity, catching the moment, that kind of thing, right? Okay, so here's the thing, right? Your assumptions your skill sets, your mindset or emotional state in the moment, all of these things, right? And more will be, a, will be huge factors as to whether or not you're going to be able to catch any of these things or none of them, right? Which one you catch, how the situation sets up and all that, right? The truth is, is that when I teach this stuff, it's just a very blanket kind of thing. I'm throwing the lessons out. You got to do things with it. But ultimately, I don't know you. Right. Unless you're one of my personal students, I don't know you. And even if you are one of my personal students, unless I've seen you in action under pressure. I don't know how you're going to act in that kind of situation. You could have all the knowledge, just like a university graduate. Right. They've got their degree. That just means that they've learned all the lessons. It's no guarantee to any employer that this person is going to be able to use what they learned or they're going to show up for work, have good work ethic. Uh, be a good team player, nothing like that, right? Or be able to use that knowledge in the context of producing results in the world, real world and not just in university, okay? It's the same thing, your belt, your rank and all that, okay? Let me tell you a quick story before we before we move on, okay? I have this young student, his name is Harlan, right? Harlan is a goofball in class, right? He's mm, 11, I think, right? Harlan was actually born with his legs twisted and his feet pointing backwards, Okay. Harlan has had at least a half a dozen or more surgeries on his legs to get his feet pointing forward. And he still wears ankle braces and things like that for stability, right? Harlan has one of the coolest friggin' attitudes of anybody that's been through that kind of thing, right? Um, he's always laughing, right? He's making light of things in class, whatever. I mean, he can, he can get serious probably like half a minute, right? But everybody kind of writes Harlan off to being a goofball, right? And in all honesty, through all the lessons... I wasn't sure if this stuff was getting in. We talk about nin. We talk about, you know, strength and courage and perseverance and all that kind of stuff. Well, we were doing some shuriken evasion in class, okay? And I start students off with rubber shuriken, but we've got some metal ones. We've got metal ones that are blank. So it's a piece of metal hitting you. It might do something. But we've got some other ones that have edges on, okay? Well, Harlan graduated to that level. Well, for whatever reason, during this one class, I'm throwing this thing and Harlan did this little maneuver that put his eye in the path of this sharp shuriken. Now, I'm throwing very lightly. So if I put a ding on somebody, it might create a red mark. But 
Harlan, and he wears glasses. So it came right across the top and tagged his eyelid, right? And I could see it, right? It started to, to you know, bleed. And, and I wanted to stop things and rush him over because we've got like three uh, first aid kits at the at the pro shop or at the at the front desk and a trauma kit, right? Why? Because it's a freaking warrior school. That's why. And anybody doesn't have this kind of stuff, including uh, insurance, they're not being a 21st century ninja. But anyway, I, I want to take him over there. And he goes, no, no, you still have stars in your hand. I said, dude, you're bleeding. He goes, I know, but you still have stars in your hand. Okay. So he has blood trickling in um, uh, and, and resting on his lower eyelid, right? But he finished out I turn it over to my assistant to finish off everybody else, take Harlan over to the, to the counter and we're doing stuff. And I'm, I'm joking with Harlan, whatever, cause I'm worried about shock setting in. Right. And Harlan's just laughing and having a good time. What? And, and I said, dude, are you okay? And he goes, I'm fine. And I kept pressing it and he goes, sensei, do you know how many surgeries I've had to my leg? This is nothing. I'm good. So we got the bleeding to stop, you know, got him all taken care of and stuff. And it didn't take much, put some antibiotic stuff on him and everything, right? And he wanted to jump back into class. I said, you know, we can call your uh, parents, whatever. You know, no, 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 I'm going to finish class. So goes back out in the class and he comes back out and everybody else is dead silent. Because the person they thought of as the, as the court jester or the dojo jester just sucked it up and kept going beyond what I'm sure a bunch of them weren't sure if they would do. And that's what I mean. I don't know what your context is, okay? So here are the lessons, okay? But you're going to have to, there's a whole lot of other factors, all right? Anyway, all right, so we have to remember that these are potentials, not givens, right? Your assumptions and all these other things are going to be factors, right? And you will have what you have. I'm going to cover four points in time, right, that we have an opportunity to act. I'm going to cover three possibilities of how you might end up unarmed against an unarmed or against an armed attacker, right? including for those of us that like to go, I'm never unarmed, okay? I appreciate your feelings of perception and elitism. However, never, ever, ever underestimate the attacker and think that you're always going to be fighting a freaking moron because that's your first mistake. And that comes straight from the big man, okay? Not just from me, okay? So you will have what you have. Not what you want to have, right? When the shit hits a fan, you're going to have whatever you have. The situation, the scenario, the timeline, whatever, okay? You don't get to pick and choose, right? You have to adapt. Having what you want to have in your toolbox when that thing happens, that happens in training. And, and to the extent that you use mindful awareness of potential problems and training solutions for those problems. And that's as far as that goes, all right? So that being said, all right, let's look at three reasons, all right? Three reasons that you could end up in a muto dori situation where he's armed and you're not, okay? So the first one, obviously, right, pure self-defense, right? It's just literally, right? Pure self-defense, all right? So... I always carry a blade, right? If I'm not carrying a, a, a firearm, I always carry at least a, a spider co, right? They're, they're just built the way I like them. They pop right out. They're designed to, to wear. So you don't have to be flipping things around and figuring out which way the blade opens. Um, the catch release and all that is protected against these guys that have learned techniques. There are special forces trained and military trained people that have learned how to avoid a knife and pop that little catch, the, the blade lock, and fold that blade on your fingers, okay? Spyderco, at least the ones that I carry, right? The catch, the, the safety release to, to put the blade back is underneath my hand. It's not down here where they can snap that and pop that blade closed on my fingers, okay? So there's certain considerations that you have when you think about possibilities or you learn how to do certain things and then, hmm, I better upgrade my own defensive things because if he comes at me with this cool trick I know, what am I going to do? Okay. All right. So here's, here's an example of this, right? Um, uh, I often in the course of uh, doing my workplace violence consulting or background checks on people or whatever in the corporate world, I often have to go to the county courthouse and look up records or do some research or whatever. Okay. And so when I go, guess what? My blade gets, 
gets uh, documented, gets put away, or I leave it in the car, right? Same thing with firearms, whatever, right? Yeah, I might have, I've, I've always had pens and things, which they'll give back to me, right? They're not preloaded. They're not special, other than they're a little bit expensive because they're a good solid metal shank kind of pen, right? And they'll stand up to pressure, okay? But if somebody comes at me with a bigger knife or a gun or whatever, it's, it might as well be a muto dori situation because it's not an it's not an even fight. Okay, so I have to surrender these things. So if something happens while I'm there, right? If the sheriff deputies are otherwise occupied, handling a bigger problem, right? Okay, so I'm I'm literally not armed. Okay, uh, I do not wear weapons to bed. I have them close, but if I wake up and Jack Wagon's right there. I got to operate with what I got to operate with, okay? Trust me, without all this extra, like, decoration, that might be a surprise. But if he's willing to come into my bedroom, I bet he's not sensitive that way, right? But pure self-defense, right? I get jumped. I literally do not, whatever the, the whatever the realm, right? It takes students or my family to the Smithsonian in D.C. or any place like this where you, you have to go through metal detectors. You can't I, – I can't take weapons in there. If something happens, right, I better come up with something else. OK. All right. Number two. And again, these are in no particular order. But number two is you are armed, but you lose control of the weapon somehow. OK. You lose control of the weapon. Right. In the middle of drawing that weapon, you always carry, whether it's a knife or the gun or whatever. And the adrenal response is kicking in. Right. You fumble with it and you drop it. OK. Or the firearm that you always trust. Right. Jams on you. Right. Or whatever it is. OK. So uh, or. Right. This guy's not stupid. Right. And you're up against somebody who disarms you. OK. And now you need to move. OK. So we don't write these things off. OK. And number three. Right. Uh, this one always throws people off when they come to my gun seminars because everybody wants to come to shoot. But we work on disarms and we work on retention. OK. People get the idea of retention. Right. Because. I'm doing things and we're going to cover these different timelines, right? Um, but he might go for my weapon, okay? Well, what about I come around the corner into a crime already in progress, his weapon's out, it's now pointing at me, and it's going to take him that much to engage me, and I have to do – I'm going to have to operate, right? So I'm going to have to operate as though I'm unarmed, at least until I can get to that weapon without risking dying in the process, OK, so I'm armed. But I have no time to access the weapon. OK, so just three, right, general categories of how I might end up in a muto dori situation, right, where I'm dealing with somebody who's armed just because I'm carrying. Yes, I'm armed. Technically, I love people that run around with the, well, technically you are armed, Sensei. Yeah, technically his gun's in my face and he only has to twitch his finger. Meanwhile, I have to clear all this. That's a different situation, okay? Armed and engaged wins over armed and not engaged, okay? All right. So three reasons I might end up there, okay? All right, so um, let me tell a story about my first exposure to timelines in this art, okay? Because I, like a lot of people, when I was learning techniques or I was learning kata from the different scrolls, right, um, I compartmentalized things, right? Here's this kata, it's called this. This is the official way it's done. Here's this kata, it's called this. Right. Here's how it translates into English. It's X, Y, Z, P, D, Q. This is how it's done. Right. But they didn't have any rhyme or reason other than I knew that this set of kata went on this particular scroll and that set of kata went on that particular scroll. Right. But I'm at a seminar and we're working on the Shinden Fudo to use Jutai Jutsu. Right. And what I get exposed to is here's this kata, but there are three or four waza that go with it. Okay, not Henka, Waza. Okay, so what I'm looking at are here's other ways to do it, 
physically, but the principles and concepts are the same, right? But there was a throw that we were working on that was a defense, right? An escape for a seonage, one of these shoulder throws, okay? And what we literally looked at were four points in the timeline where you can counter the throw. It's a throw counter that has this one name, but what it exposed me to is four points in the timeline, okay? Point four is rolling out of it, okay? But there are these, there are these four points, right? So which one do you do? Well, in training, you do all of them. But the one that you're going to do as the escape is the one that you can do in the moment you realize you have the opportunity and execute the moment you know. Okay. If you're late, you miss it. Okay. You have another opportunity unless you miss that. Right. All that. But people that only think of, you know, well, if he throws me, I'm just going to roll. Or I'm going to do a break fall. Okay. Yeah. Except in a lot of these lineages like this, the end of the throw is a slamming, jarring thing to the ground. And because of the position he's in, it's not a judo match. He draws a sword and finishes you right where you lie. Okay. Human beings lie, they don't lay. It's an English thing. Anyway, all right, so um, so <laughs> there's a three ways we can end up in this situation, right? So here, here's some here are four points, okay? Four points in time. Okay. That we have the opportunity to act. Okay. Four points. Right. We'll list them out and then we'll take a look at them very, very briefly. Again, we're, we're flying through this thing. I just want to give you enough that you can add it to your training or explore farther or whatever, further, farther. Okay. Anyway. All right. So first one, right. The first one is uh, he's reaching for his weapon. Okay. He's reaching, right? He could be reaching onto a table for a hammer. He could be going for a holstered uh, firearm or a knife. He could be reaching over to grab a stick or a broom handle or a pull cue or whatever, right? He's going for the weapon. The nature of the weapon determines what that's going to look like, okay? Somebody could be tossing it to him, and he's reaching out for it, okay? Second point in the timeline is he's drawing the weapon or otherwise, um, <coughs> so how do I write this stuff out? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, or otherwise bringing it to bear against you. Okay, he's bringing the working end, the working piece. So on a firearm, it's the muzzle, right? That little hole at the end. If that tube doesn't line up with that, that hole perfectly round pointing one of your targets, the bullet's going to go wherever that the roundness of the hole is, right? So if it's off a little bit and you get this crescent, right? It's pointing somewhere else, okay? Um, if it's a blade, right? He's bringing the point or the edge or whatever he's going to use against me. Same thing with swords, right? If it's a staff, for most people, uh, unless you're at extremely close range where he's just going to hit you with the shaft of it, he's going to hit you with one of the ends or a cane or a stick. You get the idea, right? So first point in time that I have an opportunity, if I'm aware and can move, is when he's reaching for it. Second one is when he's drawing it and bringing the, the working end to bear on my targets, okay? The third one is it's out and between us, okay? It's already out, right? It's out, out, and on me, okay? Gun's already out, muzzle's pointing at me, knife is right pointing at me or it might be touching me, whatever, okay? The, the stick staff, whatever, he's already just wound up, ready to go, okay? It might not be between me and him, but he's he's actively engaged in, you know, I, I'm in danger, right? A lot more than, than the other ones, right? And the last one, okay, is he's missing, okay, or reloading, Okay. He's missing or reloading. Okay. There's a time gap. Okay. All right. So let's jump at these. I should have just left the first one up there because uh, now I have to rewrite it. Okay. First one. Right. He's reaching. Right. 
It's not even in his hand yet. He's reaching. Okay. So the key point here, right? He's going for the weapon. The key point here is direct, committed, preemptive movement. I don't wait until he gets his hand on it to go. Okay. I don't. Right. Um, because the key point is to keep him from getting the getting control of the weapon. Okay. What my goal is here is if it's a knife in a holster uh, or a sheath, whatever you want to call it, if it's a firearm in a holster, that kind of thing, I need to keep him from clearing the holster. He may get his hand on it, but he can't get it out of the holster, okay, or the sheath, right? If he's reaching forward, okay, even if he gets his hand touching it and whatnot, he doesn't have good control of it, right? I'm going to cause him to fumble with it or whatever, right? I need to create gaps in time. I need to get, create a problem where even if he's touching it, he's not in control of it, okay? So if I can't prevent him from touching it, I need to prevent him from bringing it to bear, okay? Right? So let's go back through number two again, right? Number two is as he's drawing or otherwise bringing it to bear, right? Okay. You get the idea, right? It was on there before. Okay. So in this one, awareness is the key. Okay. I want to keep the working parts of the weapon from lining up with my body parts. Okay. This points to the fact that I need to know my weapons or whatever weapons I might have to deal with really, really well. Grandma starts to me in all my years of training, right? He just continued to make this point that knowing how to use a weapon really well is only half of mastery. It's not until you know how to defend against that weapon, right? Use it and can defend against it that you've actually mastered the weapon because using a weapon points to what? Knowing the weapon's advantages, its power, those kind of things, right? What it does for you. Knowing how to defend against it highlights what? That weapon's weaknesses, okay? How it can be used against you, okay? Those kind of things, right? We need to know both, okay? So in this case, right, um, I need to keep the working end, right? If, if he's drawing a weapon, right? I couldn't keep it in the holster and he's bringing it up. I need to do everything I can to keep that muzzle, that hole from pointing at my targets, Okay. If it's a knife, I need to keep the point or the edge from lining up with a life-sustaining piece of my body. Please note that I make a difference between the weapon engaging my body and the weapon engaging a life-sustaining system. Okay. Just assume you're going to get hit, shot, stabbed, kicked, whatever. Right. Your job is not to let not to not let those things happen. Right. I know everybody has this ideal, right? But it's a freaking attack. It's your job is not to not let those things happen. Your job is to not let them happen to the degree where the TV gets turned off and you have no worries permanently. Okay. All right. So here, what we're looking at as, as key, uh, key skill sets, right? Shielding or cover, uh, evasion, blade or muzzle awareness. We, we being able to being, being able to prioritize, right? If you're just looking at everything or he farts and you, you know, just you're you're not going anywhere, right? Did you like that? All right. So anyway, all right. Okay. So number three is right after it's already out and on you. Okay. Already out and on you. I want to make sure I don't miss anything here. Okay. So again, we're back at um, the priority is timing and direct preemptive movement. Again, is the key. Okay. So um, what I want to be really really good at is sudden quick movement to get offline. Not just flinching to the side. Well, if you move to the side, right? Yeah, except that if I move to the side, I might get winged, right? But the bigger the mass, the farther you have to go, which is why we do spine twist, right? Spine rotation, right? And not just side side, okay? So uh, I want to be good at deflection tactics, right? How do I bump that or engage it in a way that creates an open window, Okay. I need to be really good at controlling the distance. So when most people think about distance, they think about far away, okay? Problem with that is that if he has a firearm, 
the farther away I am from him, the more I have to do and the less he has to do to keep that on me. Okay. The closer I am, if I'm right in front of this thing and I suddenly move, he has to move that way farther than he did at a distance. Knife is completely the opposite, right? So with a gun, unless I can be in the next county over or the next province or whatever, whatever you guys call where you're, where you're from, right? I need to be as close to that weapon as possible. With a knife, I want to be as far away from that, pos- or that knife as possible. There is a too close range, but you better have your shit together and know that too close means inside elbow reach, right? Um, because if you're here, he can just redirect it right at the target. Okay. So I, I need to understand gaps in the body. I need to understand body limitations. So now I don't just need to understand the weapon. I need to understand the weapon and the body so that I can get this thing in those pockets or to operate properly. Okay. But the, again, the big thing here is I, I need to know the weaknesses inherent in that particular weapon. Okay. All right. And number four, right? When he's busy missing or reloading. Okay. All right. So uh, again, the priority of tactical movement and strategic thinking. This is the keys, right? Tactical movement, strategic thinking, right? And again, depending on the weapon, right? But I want to take advantage of time gaps that are created by things like inertia, gravity, whatever, right? If I can get this guy to stumble a little bit and the weight gravity is pulling down on this thing, it slows down things, right? He has to do more to get it back up in place. He has to get it back in motion. If you drive, you understand the difference. Well, in the States here, um, we call it a dead stop and a California stop. I don't know what they call it, California. But anyway, right, California stop is you don't let it come to a complete stop because you can get back up to speed faster. If you come to a complete stop, the engine has to work harder. You burn off more gas and all that trying to get it um, forward. Okay, Uh, Electricity, whatever the hell you're using these days. Right. Okay. So um, and I need to be able to use um, his need to recover and get the weapon back online, right, at me, which again, puts me back at number two, right, where I need to I need to be very, very aware of the working end of that weapon, right? I'm not trying to avoid everything, okay? And here's an example, right? If somebody swings a long, uh, let's say it's a long staff, okay? Most people don't want to be touched at all, right? There's, the, again, there's that limitation to definition or definition that limits perspective, right? So if he swings a long staff at me or even a hanbo, Right. The, the the space where this most damage is going to happen is in the is in the, the the last one to three inches of the weapon. Right. That's max, maximum torque. The closer I get to his hands. The weapon, it, it can still hurt and bump and whatnot because you're hitting you're hitting nerve endings. Right. But it's not going to do the same kind of damage. So we need to know the difference between getting hit and getting damaged. All right. So I'll move in on a long staff and let him hit me, right? Because his brain's going to register a hit. But he didn't do the same thing that he would have done if I would have stayed out here and got hit with the end of that thing because that's where the power is. This is what I mean about knowing your weapon. Not just how it works, not just how to hold it, not just stances, right? Where's the power? Where, where's the, the, the point of greatest power? or the area of greatest power, right? What creates that? There's there's a whole bunch of lessons, right? In really understanding the weapon and not just being two steps outside the cave. You know, grog finds stick, grog hit. Okay, you get really good at that, right? You don't have to learn this fight science, right? Lots of people get into fights all the time, think that they're the baddest person in the world, but never give any thought to the, the way you walk around in that attitude just gives somebody a reason to just shoot you from across the street. Or come up and friggin' just stab you in the kidney from behind. We'll just call it a day. Okay? All right. So, um, again, during reloading, right? If I can throw some rocks at him or whatever while he's in the middle of trying to get that new magazine seated or he's in the process of reloading and, and I run in, that's that's that gives me time, right? Which, when I'm, when I'm covering uh, things like um, uh, defensive combat handguns, in my course, right? One of the first questions that students get, and these are cops, security people, people have been training and, and, and shooting their entire lives, right? I'll ask how many, uh, how many types of uh, recoil do you have to neutralize to keep the muzzle on target, right? With, um, you know, 
while you're engaging the target to neutralize this, people call it kick or recoil or whatever, right? How many types, okay? There's three, right? We cover all three, okay? Um, and then one of the other questions is what one factor, right? Makes having a pistol, a semi-automatic pistol, you know, that kind of thing, right? Better than a revolver in a self-defense situation or in a firefight, okay? Now, it's true. Anything is better than nothing. And if I had a revolver, I'm going to use a revolver, okay? But what's the one thing? And most people will say number of rounds, and they would be incorrect because if you're shitty and you don't train and practice, it doesn't matter how many rounds you have. You can't miss often enough to win. The one tactical strategic advantage of having one mechanism over another is the ability to engage a bad guy during reload. And with a pistol, I can leave a round in the chamber, drop the magazine early and reload. And unless I bought, unless I made a bad life decision, right, James? Okay. Unless I made a bad life decision, right? Um, and bought one that has a magazine safety, which means if I drop the magazine, I can pull the trigger all day long and it won't fire the round in the chamber, right? Okay. During reload, if somebody comes at me, bang, right? I can I can engage them. With a with a revolver, you swing the magazine out. You swing the cylinder out. You can't do anything with it other than throw it. Okay? So anyway, again, this is what it what it means by about you know knowing your weapon, right? So I've been talking about priorities, right? Prioritizing, knowing what's important and all that, right? So we need to understand that our priorities include keep him from accessing the weapon and bringing it to bear. If you can't do that, stay in motion and keep the parts of the weapon that create the damage, right? Keep those things from lining up with and engaging with your life-sustaining targets, okay? I want to control the distance, too close, too far, based on that weapon's weaknesses, okay? Use cover and shielding to make it as difficult as possible for him to get at you, okay? I want to take advantage of his, uh, take advantage of his mistakes, reload time, him missing, the effects of natural laws on his body, like inertia and gravity, those kind of things, right? And, right, be good at not only powerful, precise, debilitating strikes, right? Because we can get out of the way and hit pressure points, make them let go or whatever. But, you know, one of the cool things to understand, like if I'm dealing with a knife and my partner, I've surprised more than enough students where they come in and go to do a, do a defense and they move in to take this arm or they hit a pressure point or whatever. And as this hand loosens up, I just reach over and switch hands. Okay? If you don't think the bad guy's going to do that because you didn't knock it completely out of his control, okay? or he's going to change hands, or uh, we have kata like this, right? Now, most of them are on the defensive side. Okay, there's a, I think it's in the gyoko to you. Uh, there's a muto dori technique where he comes at you with a soup with a with a katana, right? Comes at you, you shift to the outside, you disarm that, you make him drop it, right? But instantly he grabs his short sword and turns that on you, and then you finish up. Okay, so while most people are focused on the defensive action because the bad guy did this, most people do not practice the tactics and strategies from the attacker's side. So they're missing half the freaking lesson. Okay. I don't wait. I, what am I going to do? Oh, you win. Right. Don't kill me. Okay. No, I got a backup. Right. The fact that they carried backups speaks to thinking. Okay. Everybody carried backups because that's what everybody did. Well, fantastic. Okay. But every school had secrets that nobody was allowed to find out because everybody did shit the same way. You don't get to know these things, right? Well, it may look like we're doing everything the same. These things, you don't get to know, okay? All right, so um, while it's, okay, it's, it's good to do debilitating direct shots and whatnot to make him lose control, but ultimately, right, what I really, really wanna focus on and get really, really good at are targets that will disconnect the controller from the rest of the machine. And that doesn't necessarily mean kill it, okay? Uh, I, have a, I have a YouTube short out that, that does this technique that we, we call techniques like this, an egg beater, right? Where he comes in with a punch, and I come in and hit that arm, knock it out of the way, and then come in against Uko, right? It just looks like this scrambling kind of thing, right? People go, that doesn't work on a fight, right? You hit him like that, he'll just kick the shit out of you. No, this is a knockout point. 
if I hit that, you're going to drop. As a matter of fact, we have to be careful how hard you hit them because if you go beyond nerve and jugular carotid kind of effect, right, and all the other tubes that are in here, okay, your you got a your phrenic nerve, you got one on each side, okay, comes out of the brain back here, down under your clavicle, down the chest wall, plugs into the diaphragm on that side, okay. Even a light hit will disrupt the breathing pattern because it stalls the diaphragm. You got one on the other side, does the same thing. You also have a vagus nerve that comes out, comes under the clavicle, comes down and plugs into this little piece. Keeps it doing its thing, right? One on each side, okay? So, yep, carotid's there, jugular's there, phrenic nerve is there that controls breathing, the uh, vagus nerve is there that controls the heart, right? But if I hit harder, the vertebrae that are up there, if I, move, if I do that, what's running down through the middle of the vertebrae? The main power line, you do that, Okay, it disconnect wherever the back gets broken. If the, that that cord gets severed, it disconnects everything from that point down. But I could hit the kasumi, the the uh, temple, right, the holy spot, right, whatever. Okay, I want to get really good, right, at not. At, here's the big thing with muto dori. Okay, I'm not defending against the weapon. Okay, I'm defending against the controller. My goal, yes, I want to stay away from the working parts of this piece that he has coming at me, but my priority, my primary priority, right, is to disconnect, right, to shut down the controller because he can't come at me if he doesn't have good control of his limbs, right? Secondarily, if I can't shut him down completely, then I want to render the limbs that are necessary for moving it inoperable. OK, that's what I had today. I know uh, it's not like an hour one. Well, we're coming up on 45 minutes. So anyway, that's what I have. We're going to be working on this this Friday in our Friday virtual training. We have uh, uh, special classes for my master class Tuesdays and Fridays. And we wire things up, run it through Zoom and people can jump on and then get physical uh, examples. Right. Practice. And I can take a look at what you're doing and help you out and all that kind of stuff. But we're going to take a look at some of this stuff um, and some options and mechanical techniques for operating in each of these areas. Okay. So uh, if you want to give it a shot and just jump over there to that, that URL right there, um, click on the button. It's $4.99. You can jump on the class or not. Right. Uh, there's also links below it. If you want to jump into the full on program, like some of my guys do, and they they're getting two classes a week and they just, they're, they're getting all this stuff. Right. So anyway, but no harm, no foul, no pressure. I'm sure most of you have teachers of your own or you're already enlightened masters and you just signed on to pick holes in what I'm doing, but you do you, okay? Anyway, so this is what we have. Hopefully it will serve you, um, but remember it will only serve you if you work the process, okay? I'll talk to you next time. Be safe, train hard.